This is the Stark Truth, hosted by Robert Stark. Brought to you by StarkTruthRadio.com. Robert Stark is an American journalist and political commentator. You can listen to his podcast at www.StarkTruthRadio.com. Stark here. Uh, I'm joined here with Francis Nally, and we're going to be discussing uh, Colin Wilson. Uh, Francis, uh, great having you on. It's been a while. I mean, yeah, it's been a while. I've I've moved since to the Bay Area, and I became Gay Roger Waters or like Stern Mark Zuckerberg, and uh, I have now this whole tech elitism now a part of me, which I don't know. Um, I released a new book under my full name, uh, Joe Nally, because Francis is my middle. And uh, I, I definitely developed some new characteristic about myself, and I'm willing to give some uh, insight today. Yeah, so with Colin Wilson, did you listen to the James Amara show on mysticism, where I, I did go over Colin Wilson? Did you listen to that? Oh, yeah. I, I've listened to it. I think James J. O'Mara is a great guy. I met him before in uh, New York. Um, very mysterious person, for sure. Very eclectic, uh, Mystery Science Theater 3000 kind of guy. Um. I enjoyed Colin Wilson myself back at Rosemont College almost a decade ago. I had a copy of The Outsider, and uh, while I didn't read The Misfits, I had the occult, uh, the history, because I was also on an angry young men obsession, learning about uh, Bill Hopkins and Stuart Hall Oroy, things like that. Um, but yeah, there's a lot to say on Wilson in many different uh, respects, and it's very interesting that uh, I remember when he died, on the old Radix program. Which it's is interesting simple. because I, I lived, when I lived in the UK in 2002, when I was a teenager, like I was actually fairly close to him. And it's kind of sad I never got to meet him. No, in England. For oh, okay. about six months I lived there and like in the southwest of England. And I was like maybe like 45 minutes away from him. Yeah, because when he died, passed away, I remember Richard Spencer immediately did a podcast on his passing. Oh, and really? Because I, I know, I know, like, Greg Johnson at Countercurrents, Greg Johnson at Countercurrents is a huge fan, but I didn't know Richard Spencer was, but makes sense. Uh, so is John Morgan. John Morgan claims oh, that right. he, he went to a meeting, one of the last meetings with him, and asked him a bunch of questions. Or maybe he, was he tied, did he ever have any ties to Bowden? I forget, Jonathan Bowden. Uh, Bowden just mentioned Bill Hopkins being close to Wilson. But, right. Uh, so, what what exactly did Richard Spencer have to say about Wilson? Spencer liked the ideal that Wilson was writing about the esoteric and anti-liberal topics that most media would not cover, because Wilson was more came from a blue-collar background. His intellectual prowess was literally getting the pulp ideal that anyone basically could be a writer, which we now consider the blogger. I mean, he was blogging back then as a full-time. Yeah, he was, uh, like, he didn't, he didn't even have a university degree. He was very much, I mean, in some ways he wasn't an elitist, but he was very much against, like, credentialism. I mean, in The Misfits, in just, he gets a little college semester where he'll spend one chapter on Freud, another chapter on Mishima, another chapter on Sade, and then wrap it around with Mencken and Young which I think is so eclectic that, again, it's like getting a university pedigree, but you're getting it from someone who's just using almost creative writing and theory fiction and creating these quick theses to together. It's like it's not like you're reading Wikipedia or shallow information. It all makes sense, and it, he does this in such a beautiful way where he can get things together, argue, you know, about one thing, one being, you know, outsiders and another thing being sexual misfits, and I think, you know, back then, this kind of information was, you know, frowned upon by some of the liberal elite back then. And I guess reading Wilson leads you into that kind of uh, encyclopedia of um, avant-garde information. 
And oh, yeah, because there was, like, the scene, the angry young men in 50s uh, Britain, but it was much more, like, there's some debate whether he's part of it, because they were much more kind of, like, left wing and about, like, rebelling just for the sake of it. And that's different than what Wilson was about. But the outsider, it was, basically, it wasn't necessarily just esoteric. Like, it had mainstream fame. And a lot of celebrities from David Bowie to John Lennon were professed fans. Like, even Momar Gaddafi was, was supposedly a fan of The Outsider. It had, like, it was a very famous book at its time. And he had this brief moment where he was, like, the celebrity. And then he kind of, maybe, I don't know how famous he remained, but he faded maybe into a more kind of esoteric figure. He had this, like, I don't know if you call it, like, a 15 minutes of fame but for a brief period when he was a young man, he was very famous. But what was interesting, so with The Outsider, so it goes over a whole bunch of th- thinkers and artists, including Albert Camus, Mar- the Marquis de Sade, Yuki Mishima, Satur, uh, Ernest Hemingway, Herman Hesse, Dostoevsky, William James, yeah. they keep uh, Van Gogh, just together. many they different like artists and writers and historical figures. Right, and I think that kind of eclecticism goes into something you're interested, Robert, about this kind of occultism, where um, you're thinking of one thing, and then it does relate to the other, which sounds very contrasting to one another, but then Wilson, in such a way, you know, is kind of predating this notion where anything is possible, where it, it's not like one egalitarian whole, but it's kind of, can you're creating his own new modernity, where he picks the figures of these new idols where um, one can be uh, not sadist in such a way that you never thought of it before. And everyone kind of has this related to, uh, you know, outsiders being how is the outsider, you know, uh, particularly, I wouldn't want to say the word reactionary, but definitely against the grain of everything. And this meant- yeah, against the grain. So yeah, in some ways, like there is like a left wing kind of interpretation a being a being someone who's kind of right. rejected by society. Then there's like the failed artist trope, but Wilson goes beyond that. And the thesis is that modernity has given rise to a new person. So this person who goes against the grain, but again, it's like, it's very different than like the kind of like leftist approach or a sixties counterculture approach to rejecting conformity. Right. Like there is, there is an element of like, spiritual elitism to it, the idea that, and this might sound like a cope with the idea that these people, because they, they're superior to the masses, either like culturally, like cultural elitism, or they know certain things, or they're closer to, or they're just more on a higher spiritual level, and that because they're better than others, they can't connect to people and they become alienated. So yeah, like that. That I, kind I of sounds say, like a, that may sound like a cope or the idea of like the artist as like the true, as like the true aristocrat. So it may sound like it may sound like a cope to some, but I think I think he's actually I think he's actually spot on, and there isn't really like the narrative doesn't get there isn't really a good enough narrative for that because it's so it's been so distorted. I would say for the angry young men where you had people like John Osborne who is doing more about, you know, English struggle, What you're talking about is more the leftist kind of ideal of the egalitarianism for the people. Or, yeah, yeah, like egalitarianism but, for the people or just rebelling against tradition. It's, but it's then, different from that. Yeah, but then Wilson's different because Wilson's talking about this elitism that you do see in right-wing circles. Or even like the, the Nietzschean ideal that goes through without, uh, you know, the post-libertarian alt-right ideal, which is kind of dying out now. And I think this is the reason why Wilson and Hopkins separated is because they were more on the ideal of the individual reigning supreme, and he is the artist, and that's the Nietzschean ethics. Uh, I mean, Stuart Holroyd had something very similar about the ideal that the, the government wasn't up to par for the English needs, but you do see that transition from going against the state and talking about the whole of people versus versus fighting for something greater. Uh, And that's why I think it's a new form of modernity that Wilson's crafting because he's choosing these new eclectic figures to define a new reality or new uh, discipline of thinking about things. And in a way we're choosing new philosophers as crass as they may be 
but um it's 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 almost everybody's having their own personal modernism and ultimately i think wilson is telling that the average writer is just as intellectual as somebody at oxford i mean again wilson also extended upon the lovecraft uh cthulhu mythos by writing his own lovecraft stories he got into conspiracy theory you know, it's something that sound like Alex Jones crass would do. Also, but he, like, he would a lot of that crime as well. Right. And he, he, his knowledge was so, it was everywhere that like somebody. I think, I'm not 100% sure, but he was so prolific that I think he broke the record. I'm not 100% sure, but for writing, for writing the most books of any author, like he could write one book a month, which is insane. Right. And I think it was the time where you didn't have internet and there was an industry where people want to catalog things that weren't readily available and Wilson was doing that full time as a job. And that's why he has over a hundred books. And I think it's hard to do that now because we have the internet, we have the Twitter and I guess everybody has covered everything, but it's hard for an individual to know all these things at once and to tie it in a beautiful way where you can fight for one thing. And I think, again, this has to do with when you know a lot, you can make a uh, rhizomic, you know, connections where like a rhizome is a, root that tangles to one another so going back into his work on the occult what the occult does is it translates one thing and sees the magic in another thing like if this thing was violent in one area and that area it could mean something that you were foreseeing and uh i think that's a lot you know oh yeah he was big on premonitions right right and so i've seen that personally in wilson's work because you know, again, going back on Spencer, Johnson, Morgan, there is this libertarian reading, this Nietzsche ideal that... Uh, well, what exactly, like, what do, you, what do you think about the in, the interest that Spencer and Johnson had in Colin Wilson? Like, what is what is it specifically about Colin Wilson that appealed to that scene known as the New Right? Because, I mean, there are left-wing, I mean, there's left-wing and libertarian people and who are into him, it's not it's not just like a niche right wing thing, but there is something in particular that appealed to like the countercurrents crowd and or to someone like Richard Richard Spencer. I think it it's the fallacy of the Nietzsche and Ubermensch guy, where there's going to be this individual that's you have to lead and this guardian that's like a fake Plato knows everything. And this kind of gives the ideal that somebody is more smarter in meritocracy than somebody else. And I think this is a weird, again, bad libertarian reading because I'm, because the, the problems with that would assume that the elite that Wilson is criticizing through the works like the occult, he's not the elite doing this, but he's giving the power to the reader that uh, some of the people behind all this, you know, it comes off as more of a populist message. I, I kind of have a populist understanding than Wilson, than rather a selfish Nietzschean one. So I think through... Well, it could be, I think it could be both. Like, it's sort of like there are, like, with occultism, like, a lot of it, like, I think you have to go beyond kind of like the kooky, like, Alex Jones type conspiracy theories, and there, but there are these, like, psychological mechanisms, and you can say, like, metaphysical mechanisms that those in power... Uh, they use, they, they manifest, and it is sort of like going past the gatekeepers and making those, making that subject matter more accessible. Cause there, there is legitimacy. I mean, I think there is legitimacy, like, to the occult, and, like, an Alex Jones type approach would be, like, just saying, like, that stuff is evil, but not actually talking about it intellectually. I, I just think back to, uh, Thinking Aloud and some of the programs where, um, that he was on that the you know, older program. Oh know, yeah, I think I, no, I listened to that. Wilson was on in back in the eighties on Jeffrey Mishleb's New Thinking Aloud. You know, and today, you know, it's amazing that Jason Giorgiani is on new episodes. And so in that tradition of thinking aloud, um, there's always been this kind of ideal that the people should know about the esoterica from, you know, parapsychology to what is being hidden. It's not just esoterica, they're a lot of these different things, parapsychology and and new thought, uh, spiritual science, like the other thing is like near-death experiences. There is like sci- there is legitimate scientific studies that back a lot of this stuff up. Right. And I think instead of the right position where there's elitism in charge, uh, I take more of the position where um, 
it's a new age type of information and kind of the realm of Alan Watts teaching people, you know, you know, teaching people the first time about, you know, Asian history and philosophy, the same way Wilson is giving intellectualism for the masses. And I think that can be liberating in many ways, the same that, you know, watching a single episode on thinking loud can be where you're now learning about, you know, ghosts and aliens and an underground temple in the middle of the Atlantic ocean or something like that. And I think Wilson takes that all with serious intent and that could, you know, synthesize with some of the intellectual talk we're having now. And I think that's the important thing we get from Wilson's eclecticism. It isn't reserved to say the past of the tradition, but he's looking forward by taking the things that mean something to us in a very, uh, in, that anybody can be the intellectual. So with the outsider, like, yeah, like the question is like for, for people who are, who are the outsider, like how to relate to an unjust world. I think the point about the outsider is how Wilson would describe them is they're actually, they're idealists. They're not, they're not cynics. A cynic is someone who sees everything as rotten and tries to work the system. But these, these thinkers, the outsider, they're highly idealists. They have a clear vision of what the world ideally should be. And Wilson advocates uh, spirituality as a method of liberation from alienation, that basically the outsider needs God, but not necessarily in a conventionally, like, uh, Christian sense. I don't think Wilson, I don't, I'm don't. i not 100% sure, but I don't think he was a Christian. No. But he mm-hmm. was definitely, like, a spiritualist. Many people make the accusation of pagan, but that's a little too pre-Christian, but occultism sounds more right because anything can be magical. And, you know, if, if you believe in aliens in one area or believe in Lovecraft myths those in another, you might as well believe those as sincere beliefs as his own because the individual can craft an ideology that goes against everyone can craft their own personal ideology and you don't have to go with one subset that's going to go against everyone else. So I think that ta- yeah, he takes something like mysticism and a lot of like a lot of mystic th- th- uh, thinkers it's all about magical thinking, but he explains mysticism in such practical terms. So he talks about the contrast like being the robot which is just going for the motions and being numb and then like but then having this like peak experience which are moments in life when there's a strong sense of intensity. So yeah, there's a strong sense of intensity, which he calls the peak experience, and he had some work with, like, Mas- the psychologist Maslow, of Mas- known for Maslow's hierarchy of, of needs. But basically, like, so, like, one example is, like, if you travel, you're having a, ch- a shift in consciousness, and you feel more alive, and there's more, you feel like your life is expanding, where if you spend a, a whole week just doing the same routine with either work, or you're just browsing the internet, then everything feel it feels like a simulation it feels fake everything blurs together and your life feels short and so it's about getting this like practical intensity out of life and if everything then if everything is consciousness then if we can shift consciousness then basically so yeah changing perception of of consciousness basically becomes like a form of alchemy and there's this word in kind of religion it's kind of neoplatonic like theurgy where you use like ascetics to kind of like create a spiritual experience. So that's yeah, like that's very right. So it's much like, like the view path. that basically right. no, but Wilson did basically he viewed that consciousness had a mystical component. I think Twitter does that in a weird fake way. A lot of social media people are realizing is that it's more um, important and exciting to get a, a personal DM by internet pen pal than it is now to go outside and do things because of how the cartoon nature of anime avatars and internet memes makes you feel that this consciousness is being constructed by you by power social relationships and people. Well, it is, it is again, like when you're on the internet too much, you feel, you don't really feel like you're living, but it is still, I guess you could say it's a form of mysticism because these powerful like tech tech companies they're they're taking control over people's subconscious i mean that's a form of mysticism that's a form of alchemy as well because you're basically you have like control over people's subconscious and their deepest desires and all that it's like 
my, my friend, our friend Alex Goldstein, talks about dream world, where one of the plausible alternatives is that you got to create your own dream world or go into it somehow. He's not going to tell you how you get into dream world, but it's very comparative to Wilson's ideal of going back on the individual Nietzschean ideal that the intellectual can so be. So dream in. world, it could be read literally or figuratively, but it's like another dimension. It's basically like a, it's a parallel dimension. Kind of like in my, in my book, Journey, in my book, Journey to Vapor Island, to Vapor Fornia, there's the vapor, like, basically like that. Right. And there's other weird, um, And it's a major theme in, in literature and cinema. Right. And even in philosophy that they're talking about now, and it goes straight through Wilson, whether you're talking about, um, John Cyril and the ideal of that there's a Chinese room interpreting things, or, um, this might sound weird, but or the idea that when you dream, you go into you enter another dimension. Right. It's it's this kind of it's being discussed in philosophy right now, and I don't want to speak for Goldstein, but Goldstein believes that there's these magical things in our bodies that uh, kind of do things for them. I think the word is psych- psycho. Uh, John Cyril cited it before, and he wrote a paper on it, but it reminds me of that same kind of magic. Colin Wilson's is talking about, and that's a part of a method to get into dream world and to be realized. It also kind of reminds me of like, like Neoplatonism and the idea that there are these different spiritual realms, and like the Neoplatonists, they believe that the more intense, like if you feel the more intensity you feel, you're you're getting closer to a higher spiritual realm. Right. So, you know, John Cyril and Donald Davidson, they're philosophers that talk about consciousness. And it reminds me of, you know, Donald Davidson's thought experiment about the swap man, whether, you know, if you if your spirit leaves your body and your body becomes artificial, is it really you? And so I think the Internet is like that. It kind of creates now artificial realities, which you think is you, but you really just relay them to these weird preferences. And I think that's a part of the negative distortion of things. That's well, what Wilson called what Wilson calls a robot, right? And just thinking of that, and the Davidson would call the Swamp Man. So it reminds me of that. And uh, both Davidson and Cyril try to find these philosophical intentions to get outside that box and realize our potential, so we can find that dream world state. Did you comment uh, on Bill Hopkins, the occult in a history? Well, um, well, Wilson. He wrote The Occult of History, and that oh, was... Oh, that's Wilson's book, The Occult yeah, of he does, History. He, he does mention Hopkins in the text, his friend, which, you know, he wrote The Leap or The Divine of Decay, which is about uh, Peter Popoff. No, not Peter Popoff. Not that, that guy. Uh, Peter Paul, how, uh, I forget the character's name. But Peter was, um, he was this wannabe fascist guy. And he had dreams of being this, like, totalitarian uh, guy. I haven't read my copy in forever. Uh, I actually have a signed copy by Bill Hopkins, actually. I, I bought it signed. And um, he, there is this kind of Nietzschean ideal of this powerful man, and Peter's going to be strong and get through with it, but people don't believe in him. And it kind of reminds me of your themes in your book, Robert, about uh, Gnome and Journey to Vapor Islands, where you start out as this like weak character, but then you get stronger over time, and then people see that the... The, the small man does have power in a weird way, even though it might sound strange. It's like the Confederacy of Vinces in many ways. Right, right. But yeah, in the occult, Wilson really stretches upon how it works or how to think about it and what people would do, especially like in the nature of tarot cards or uh, sign reading and horoscope, which you wouldn't think would be occult measures, but people use these designs to... uh see things that other people could not see before. And it goes without saying, if you know certain things, kind of like this weird game of Max Weberian power knowledge, then it's just like the intellect knowing things that the people are not allowed to know. And there we get back into the Alex And the power comes from having access to hidden knowledge. Correct. And that gets into Alex Jones' theory of what you know and what you don't know, right? But the problem is like someone like Alex Jones... Is he says people to wake up, but like the right the right wing populist conspiracy theorists, they they don't want ordinary people to have access to the metaphysical realms either, because they'll say it's like evil and satanic. Right. So, so they kind of they they keep people they keep people in the dark as well in a different sense. So in a weird way, in Bill Hopkins' The Leap or Divine and Decay, Peter Plowoff 
he's like this individual who knows the power that he can be this great leader, like maybe like Hitler and Mussolini and people realize that that's a bad energy, but in a way he's not going to do genocidal acts of totalitarianism. Yeah, just if you look at powerful figures of history, they were tapping into some kind of like, I know I believe a lot of them were tapping into some kind of mes- metaphysical force. And again, that's open to interpretation. It could be, there could be a, sci- a psychological interpretation for it, but there could also be some kind of more esoteric interpretation of being tapping into like a metaphysical realm. Like I would say something like creativity and being an artist is tapping into like a metaphysical realm. It's a form of expression that you couldn't express before. And you might be expressing a subconscious level to yourself that you didn't know before. So like in the misfits, Wilson writes that, you know, Freud and screen memories, you know, Freud was talking about how a yellow dandelion and the color yellow. By misfits, do you mean the sexual misfits or there's another book just called the misfits? Wilson, he's writing about Freud. So, so, so there's so, two. Is there are there two books, the Misfits and the Sexual Misfits? Uh, just it's the same book with Wilson, uh, the Misfits. Okay. So, but but I'm just using the example like Freud's screen memories, and Wilson is he's reviewing it and thinking in terms that you know the color yellow is like the shirt you have and the, the yellow dandelion, and Freud is getting aroused over this memory that a woman wearing yellow, and then when you see flowers. Oh, that's very Will. That's very Wilson esque because, like, it's sort of like how you you smell a certain scent and it brings back a memory that you had from childhood. That's very, that's something that Wilson would talk a lot about. Or certain certain aesthetics, certain like scents bring back intense memories from the past, and then you just get like the moment you smell something, you get really you have this really intense psychological experience, but you you get like really strong nostalgia. I think another example is like, do you know how kind of like when you're a child, you have, you visit the same place, but your sense of, because of your sense of consciousness, it feels and looks totally different. Like you could go somewhere on vacation as a child, as a small child, and then come back there to visit again as an adult, and it feels totally different. Like that's, that's yeah. like a perfect example of how consciousness, uh, shapes reality. It's like knowing too much as an adult versus finding the subconscious past that unlocks that dream world reality where... Well, your earliest memories, they feel hypnagogic like dreams. Right. And so in a weird way, someone becomes a gardener because they get aroused over the thought of those good memories of being a flower. And it's not as sophisticated as one would be a gardener. So you do have this Freudian ideal with power knowledge. And Wilson's interpretation of that is that Wilson is telling us that we should be more aligned with some of our unconscious discoveries that maybe the reason why I act this way is because of some Freudian mishap that happened as a kid. And therefore it reminds me yeah. of like, That's a I think of like just like, like psychology and politics, how there's these different, how on one hand you have, well, you have the, like the populist kind of like demo populist demagogue on one hand and then you have the liberal rationalist who pathologizes everything as like racist or reactionary and those two dichotomies. And I think I talk with politics like a, ra- like a radical center and how there needs to be, needs to be like a really, a, a good, stronger understanding of like subconscious psychological motives. But at the same time, like not unlike the liberal where you kind of shun them as like dirty to kind of embrace them, and maybe if you want to say like health more healthily manage them, but I think I, like the psycho like psychosocial motives behind behind politics and behind like personal decisions are extremely important and should be embraced as part of like politics and sociology. In a way, stand up comedy and humor is that release which you couldn't say right. in society. So somebody can talk about race, like Margaret Cho talking about. Asian politics in her art, even though if I was to be political commentator on that, that would be considered racist. But if- like the two biggest taboos on society are racism and sexuality, and those are both heavily shaped by like subconscious biological uh, motives. Right. I actually talk about that in some of my work, where I believe that the five taboos of liberalism tend to be, uh, I believe, race, sexuality. 
uh, work and space and violence. Uh, and those kind of things have a historic history to them, whether they're through Bonobo monkeys or violent chimpanzees. We as humans tend to think that we're liberals and we're above uh, sex, race, violence, work, or space. But, you know, we always go back to those things because they make up of our, our adult life so much and we don't really have control. We can only know how those things work. And I think what happens is that's why you have these secret societies that know about the truth of sex or work or race or space and they use it to their advantage and keep everyone else dumb not to know. So that's on the flip side of comedy. Yeah, a lot of it's not even about, like, magic per se. But I think a lot of, like, when people talk about, like, when people talk about these secret societies like the Freemasons, it's not even, like, about magic. I think it's just a lot of it could just be having an honest discussion about these things like we are now. Right, but they're more about uh, doing things that break the rules. That's like, true, yeah. And, like, we've coined this term before, the blowjob king economy where they're a secret uh, Silicon Valley elite or Hollywood elite that give each other blowjobs in favor of high six-figure jobs, and which we think is silly at first. It's like, like a metaphor. Comedy. Yeah, the blowjob is the metaphor. But it's, the a, blow- like, it's sort of like the online like the online social media grifters who demand your subscriptions and follow, but what they give you in return is nothing but metaphorical goo. It's it's both metaphorical and real because there's actually people in the Epstein circle that yeah. actually do give casting couch blowjobs, and that's have now been a huge history with like with the whole uh, Me Too movement or the next outing of a celebrity. It's like we're coming to terms that there was this eyes wide, there is a w- eyes wide, eyed shut, you know, elite who do the blue job king stuff, but it's also teaching people below them in a weird way where we should mimic them through like this weird capitalist transaction grift in our economy of selling a product that we're fake and we suck each other off in order to gain access ahead. So we emulate the whore or the Moloch when everybody's worshiping. So that's also a concern of some of the decadence. I think Wilson. But the thing that like with, with sexuality, the thing is, is it becomes like with sexuality and like the blowjob Kings, it becomes like a, it becomes like a basic transaction, like under consumerism, but there isn't necessarily like the intensity, that intensity that like Colin Wilson is talking about. Right. It's more like, uh, I mean, I hate the word. They love to talk about consensual ideals. Like, oh, they were consensual, even though it becomes a ritual, I think. People don't be like, oh. Because, yeah, know. like people, people talk about like the whole obsession with like, consent and relationships like affirmative consent like yeah like everyone agree that like that like rape is a is a bad thing but like but what consent it really is about it's not about just saying you're against rape it's a it's basically like mi- turning relationships into something bureaucratic and then becoming the robot like you take away the spontaneity and passion out of life. That's basically what it is. But it's like, would somebody be consent to, like, kill and eat you or something? Or consent so horrible that you can't even say it or else it'll be blackmailed by the mafia. And I think there's a lot of secret mafias out there that will blackmail you if you go outside the cult. And I think that the blowjob king idealism is about that because one person is, you know, got there because they had a secretly blowjob to get there, but they can't, nobody knows it. But we're curious about, you know, the people who they did, like an Epstein theory. Yeah, that gets back to Colin Wilson's book on sexual, on the sexual misfits. Like he talks about, so he talks about like degenerates and, but he talks about like sexual degenerates and deviants in an almost like Promethean or Nietzschean sense that they're pushing the bounds of consciousness. So he talks about like the Marquis de Sade. Is really like the essence of the Marquis de Sade was pushing, pushing the bounds of consciousness rather than just like, just shocking right. people. And the same as like, Colin Wilson had interest in serial killers and he even corresponded with, uh, Ian Brady. And yeah, Wilson's approach, that was like Wilson's approach to sex and sexual outsiders. But the big theme was like, uh, consciousness. So he talked about sometimes when he had sex with his wife, like he turned into the robot and it was just a physical motion. So he's actually not like, he's not necessarily like denouncing these. I think normally like people on the right would just denounce these people as just degenerates. But 
you say like those who are seeking out more extreme experiences, they're seeking in a Nietzschean sense, a sense of expanded consciousness. So like, he's not necessarily like, like with serial killers and like Ian Brady, I don't think he's defending the actions, but he is saying like, they're people who need to seek out like a really radical extreme form of consciousness. I think there's a big misunderstanding what sadism is. Cause when you say sadist, you're talking about somebody who enjoys violence or somebody who enjoys evil. Well, doesn't the definition more... of sadism is someone who gets pleasure from inflicting pain upon others. But we're talking about the man himself and what his beliefs were. So in a but way, the Marquis he de Sade, yeah, he was really about the essence of Dassad wasn't like just shocking people or, or just, it wasn't even just like hedonism. He goes beyond that. I think it was really. What Wilson says, the essence of the Marquis de Sade, <clears throat> was that he was really about, like, pushing a radical expansion of consciousness and doing all these extreme, like, pretty shocking, depraved acts as a way to increase, increase like, the intensity. And I guess it's also another comparison is, like, a drug addict. Like, with a drug addict is they can't handle how day-to-day life is numb, so they, they get intensity from drug addiction or like thrill seekers and people into extreme sports, they do incredibly dangerous and reckless uh, stuff to get that intensity. I wrote an article titled "Ethical Sadism," where but I like one example. Like one example is Colin Wilson's references some famous, I think, author. I think who was suicidal, but then when he when he was about to commit suicide, he was playing Russian roulette and. Because that created such a strong sense of intensity, then he decided he didn't want to go through the suicide and he wanted to live because of that intensity. Like, that's an example of that. And was in correspondence with the serial killer Ian Brady in prison. Wasn't there some connection between Ian Brady and Wilson with Peter Soto? What was the, Peter Soto, what was that book, uh, Gates of Janus, about? Uh, Gates of Janus, that was published by uh, Adam Parfrey on Feral House. There was, and that was Soto's book. Yeah, that was, that was Ian Brady. He wrote his own serial killer memoir in jail and he talked about the history of serial killers and how they acted. And Barfree thought as a fun shock jock reason was to publish that. And, uh, Wilson did the intro and Sotos had a funny outro to it. Now here's the funny part. They made a second edition where, uh, the families of the victims of Brady got upset over Sotos' writing and as well as Brady because he didn't express himself. So I think Peter Sotos wrote one of the most powerful pieces he ever did called Bait in the second edition, not the first edition. So I strongly recommend getting the second edition because Sotos' Bait is a very powerful polemic against uh, attacking Ian Brady and what he does and Sotos being more about how people are kind of foolish and let the media tells them what to do. It's very reminiscent of Jim Goad and how people fall for their own myths and how people are not strong enough to know what's really going on behind violence. But yeah, that's kind of the avant-garde. With uh, Colin Wilson, he said if with his correspondence with Brady, like Brady lacked any kind of awareness that what he did was wrong. And he kind of like almost like act, almost like the immaturity of like a small child where took really like took really offense any like small slight against him like he was extremely narcissistic that's what brady was about i think what fascinated wilson again was that like the seeking of extreme intensity of experience you know dennis cooper was also like that yeah like so like but yeah so but you do have like these different like these different writers and like you have like the Marquis de Sade, you have someone like Peter Sotos, but then also Dennis Cooper, or you have like a really disgusting book like Sam Delaney's Hog. And I haven't read it, but it's supposed to be pretty, pretty depraved and disgusting. But I guess the question, like there's this whole debate about whether it's just shocking for the sake of it, or there's any intellectual or artistic value to it. I think it's more, uh, artistic. And more on the intellectual, as I wrote an article called Ethical Sadism, where instead of we think of sadism as an act of pure evil, we have to look at the man himself and see sadism as an inverse of Rousseauianism, and that sadism is letting loose all your feelings and freedom, and whatever well, you... yeah, it is the it. inverse of Rousseau. So Rousseau is the foundation for liberalism, and Rousseau's belief was that humans are inherently good and egalitarian. Obviously, if everyone embraced the philosophy of the Marquis de Sade society would be pure chaos, 
but the thought is truer to human nature because people do have these deeper, darker desires, and society, whether it's liberalism, modernity, or more like traditional religious society, like under Christianity, people do have to kind of suppress their darker sides, and the Marquis de, someone like the Marquis de Sade was just saying everyone should just do whatever feels good to them and this emperor totally embrace their darker side their and their baser instincts. Sadism is kind of like a form of activism. It's a weapon of how to use it. And I think the left knows what sadism is while the right feels it's too icky. What do you mean by sadism? You mean inflicting pain on others? Yes, because what you're doing is you're inflicting pain against that what tries to destroy you. So it can be an act of justice and ethics when you apply sadism against things you don't like. Sadism that's more morally sanctioned, but that, yeah, I mean, that exists in all political systems. Okay, from like ex- Christianity to, to liberalism. Right. Communism so, to fascism. So, uh, you know, for example, it always happens in sex and cheap porno films, but if you had white men who were mad at black women, but then watch a bukkake against a black woman, then they're getting their sadist <laughs> fix. But they're also, uh, you know, transforming their desire of beauty. But they're, they're, again, like, they're getting in touch with that darker primal urge, but they're doing so under the guise of just liberal liberal consumerism. So, yeah, like, I, I wrote an article, like, I wrote an article about, about sexuality uh, several weeks ago, and the thing about, like, Pornography, like, it's like the one aspect of neoliberalism and mass consumer society that is, that is actually honest about like, the, the darker side of human nature. Uh, Jacques Lacan famously compared Immanuel Kant and the categorical imperative with the work of uh, sadism, simply because if you let people do duty and what they want to do, everybody would create an ethical kind of sadism. And that's what Lacan tries to figure out as well. I, again, I think sadism can be used as a tool of activism where you can, um, uh, it's not, you're giving pain against that which made you, it's destroying what destroys you. That's like the basis of sadism. And then it's it something or ethical. Sadomasochism, you say it's sadomasochism. I mean, if you want to add masochism in there, that's pain on yourself, but, um, that's a little different. I would say you're transforming something and, creating you know you're destroying again and i think that beautiful expression the right is afraid to embrace that because they're so prudish and they didn't realize or if they talk to the enemy somehow they're not faithful and realize i think the left knows what sadism is and can utilize it whether it's through comedy or their own humor um but i think the right with sadism it's almost incompatible but i think if you were to have a right-wing sadism it's really well, neither. Well, the problem is neither. So, well, neither the left nor the right are really want to totally be honest about human nature. They both they both want a purity signal. Like I think right wing sadism would be like this bizarre, like you know, white nationalist having sex with black women to get revenge so they can have, but then they end up liking black women and incorporating them as black white nationalist. You know, it's like a fantasy that you have and you get off by, but it fixes the relationship because you become empowered by your sadism. And I think that's the true nature of what sadism It's not so much... And, yeah, like, we, we, but with, like, Wilson and, like, the sexual misfits, he doesn't really look at them in moralistic terms. Like, I think, like, the frankness is very surprising for someone of the right. And then you even take, you even take, like, his approach to the trans issue that he doesn't talk about, like, trans people the way you think, like, someone who is right-wing... Like when the book was written, I think it was eighties, but I'm not sure. But he taught he talks more about the tra- like about being trans as like a different experience of consciousness. Um, you know, Dennis Cooper in his book or short story Ugly Man talks about how uh killing people or giving them AIDS is a form of love. And that's a form, I believe, of neo sadism. It's also empowering because if someone does have AIDS, they can die knowing that they gave. Oh, he some says killing people. people, killing people of AIDS is empowering. Yes, because you have. Yeah, AIDS. I mean, yeah, Nothing. like that's well, it's like from a right wing perspective, or even a normie, pretty normie perspective, like that's like the most degenerate thing 
you could do. But that's also the the tenet of sadism, where you're doing something you're not allowed to do. And again, and Dennis, you have to. I guess I guess I kind of get what you're coming at. Like it, it sounds insane, but the idea with with sadism. So if you inflicting pain on someone means it means that you, but also means that you really you really care about something. Like there's this element of passion. Like a lot of people who go through just consumerist life and they work and they consume like there's no there's no there's no passion no meaning so like the two so like love and hate are like ex, are the two extremes and they kind of both have to kind of exist they complement each other with dualism and a lot of people they just go about just this day-to-day life and they just consume and there's no there's no passion on either there's no love but there's no intense like hate and it's kind of like it kind of gets to the theme of like, of like something like ethno nationalism, like the ethno nationalist has an intense love for their people, an intense hate of the outgroup, while the message of like the liberal utopian ideal of John Lennon's, of like John Lennon's song Imagine, is incredibly nihilistic because there's no, there's no, there's no meaning to anything. Right, I and mean, you have to find the meaning through the expression, what you're trying to say. And so, you know, just going back on Cooper's case, when somebody goes, I want to kill you, they're saying, I love you, because they're enjoying the pathos of death. And so I think that's abundant in the whole gay culture dying of AIDS. It sounds very transgressive, but I also think that's the sadist ethos, is that you commit these acts of your own free perversion, will what you want to do, but you're doing it to feel empowering, and that's why they they are motivated by it. And so, also breaking people who are like deviants, they they really get like a big adrenaline rush from breaking a societal taboo as well. Like just for the sake of it, that's a huge part of it. In the case of being anti-liberal, one becomes an ethno-nationalist because that's considered being an evil Nazi caricature. So by being an ethno-nationalist, you're having this ethical statism to allow, uh, you know, your so you're own saying ethno-nationalism is eth- ethical statism because mm-hmm. you're you're being harsh on the outgroup for the love of your in-group. Right, and it can be that way. And in the return, they can r- have their form of it too, whether that's like our society saying they hate white people and they want to kill white people and they're enjoying it. And then you say it in the opposite and express it on the daily stormer. So in a way that <laughs> can empower and go back to Wilson and enough of this magic this chaos magic, eventually things become true and we get our real desires, which have been repressed. And then we create racial harmony from it because then there's this rhizomic possibility of anything happening. And yeah, with Wilson, so yeah, he also had interest in H.P. Lovecraft and cosmic horror, but then he wrote, he also wrote like several science fiction novels, and the theme was humans transcending their physical and mental limits and evolving into superior beings. So would you say was Wilson, like, was he interested in transhumanism? I, I'm not so sure on that. I think he might have been interested on the subject for sure, and you can make those connections. Uh, I would say, again, going back on the New Age ideal of being enlightened, I think the secret information, I, I can't say I've read anything about the transhumanist interest. Yeah, uh, I think he did have ties to the California New Age scene, like Esalon, and also the human potential movement. Yeah, transhumanism now is like the number one talking point among accelerationist or even the, the theory fiction types. I think transhumanism has potential to go both ways. I think it can be a radical expansion of consciousness, something Promethean and Nietzschean. But, I mean, obviously religious Christians are going to close to it out of their way. But I think the real danger is that of transhumanism is that people's brains will be rewired. Will they just be like these robots? And like some scientists was saying, like, we can rewire people's brains so they don't, using magnets, so the spiritual side of people's brains are dead, but that also means like they can't become like racist, so they just become like these like pure robots and they have no There's a whole theory about the equity mind chip. What what they're gonna do is they're gonna put equity mind chips into black people. So if black people start another riot, the mind chip would stop them from having a riot and blacks would be given more white people social control. White people wouldn't have the mind chips because they're the one planning in them. So all this stuff like HPD 
and like racial science would become meaningless because everyone would be like everyone's brains would be rewired. Everyone would just be like the same. Right. And, then, and because it's equity, some people get it. And then some people are privileged not to have it. You know, Chinese people will have their chips to make sure they're working and blacks will have chips to act white, like white people, which would destroy the difference of people because you're creating transhumanist equity mind chip control into people, which I think the elites actually want to do as their um, solution against racism. But it's just going to cause more black nationalists to riot. When yeah, I mean, I think transhumanism... It has potential to go other ways for something for greatness, but also something totally dystopian. Our state wants us to celebrate liberal, individual, democratic, you know, capitalism, but they don't want sincerity and identity. You no, can... they don't want sincerity. But yeah, well, but with Wilson, I guess a few more things about him is he did correspond with Enoch Powell, who's considered, like, he wasn't overtly political, but he corresponded with Enoch Powell, who's considered, like, a fascist. Actually, Wilson has been accused of being of being a fascist to some of the left, so his ideas, just his ideas of, like, kind of like the Ubermensch and being ex- living to extremes that sound very Nietzschean, so he has been accused of being a fascist. To kind of, like, summarize Colin Wilson, what, like, what can we learn from Colin Wilson's idea to build, like, I don't know if you want to say a new social movement, artistic movement, or uh, political or new like political philosophy. I think Wilson term. Wilson kind of predicted the internet before it happened. Today, everyone has access to digital information, and we can literally solve the most complicated questions we have through quick answers on Google. With this means, we can create really quick Chicago-style citations and create an academic paper in less than three hours on Substack. Now that everyone has that and everyone has a Substack, we all became Colin Wilson eclectic types, getting citations from My Little Pony to Acid Communism. And this can give us new insights where we become our own blue-collar pulp uh, academics in a way. And then we're citing each other, talking about how sophisticated we can be as we're doing creative writing versus creative research. And I think Colin Wilson was really the first to do that in a time where uh, after the war, people want to sit down and read and actually um, mean or discuss things that actually matter to the way. And I mean, the Gen X would call it postmodernity, but I think postmodernity is over because we never really got over modernity. Everyone just became a part of the, the pod system. So really transhumanism, and accelerationism is the talking point, and there, the modernity is still existent. There never was a period after modernity because that's just, you know, egalitarian talking points that Wilson was already pointing out in all of his writings. So yeah, I think that anti-liberalism is prevalent. I think we're getting an age of anti-liberalism. Liberalism is kind of what the boomer and Gen X generation have. And in the American scene, people are looking for sincerity. You know, as I said before, uh, the state is kind of obsessed with being an individual. It doesn't matter. There's definitely, like, limitations to, like, irony culture. But, yeah, I think if you were going to talk about, like, a new political, a new philosophical framework, I think a lot of it, like, we can save for, like, a future show. Like, there's a lot of things, like, a, a lot of, like, political and philosophical themes I want to revisit. But you're saying you would, you really stress you want to see a return to sincerity, but also embracing Embracing human nature, embracing that like deeper passion. Right. Um, a great example would be, you know, the kind of clown world, global homo stuff we might see on the Disney Channel. They might have a show about uh, a half Thai, half Irish cartoon character, but she's not allowed to take an identity politic around that. Instead, she's supposed to be a beige power. Uh, I have no race kind of person. And so the thing is I'm saying is you have to be sincere about being a brown Thai Irish Eurasianist and having that as your identity politic. Oh, so you're saying like with Asian Aryanism, it's actually Asian Aryanism, like the the white the white ethno nationalists will call you a degenerate for promoting race mixing, but you're actually saying rebelling against this idea that like we're gonna have this one blended society of like these beige blobs who all have the same like corporate consumer culture. Everyone is like mixed together with no identity. Like that's the dis- that's like the dystopia for 
the identitarian right, but you're saying like Eurasianism is a rebellion against that. Right, because it works in the framework that if it is global homo uh, mixed plan, the people are still going to ask for identity politics. The state makes sure to advocate irony and blandness and detachment because they are afraid that once the mixed like Irish Thai person wants a particular Irish Thai identity politics, then it's bad because uh, that person has an identity politic and sincerity about those traditions and cultures and institutions. So, yeah, like you should like for people of like mixed ancestry. I mean, it's it's difficult, but they should try to transcend beyond consumerism and just a basic American identity and then try to build something like build a cultural national identity that matches all their different different ancestral groups, which is which is kind of confusing, but I think that's what people should strive for, even if they're of a mixed background, either like mixed race or, or a white person, like basically like me of like a mixed European background. That's why like Disney, if you watch their cartoon shows, they try so hard to say, well, that's why you're going to date a black person. That's why you're going to date an Indian person. They deliberately do it on purpose to confuse you and not to have sincerity. But eventually that Indian Chinese person is going to fight for an Indian Chinese politics. The institutions are might be there, but if you accelerate it enough, and that's why this has to do a lot with transhumanism, people are just going to stop mixing and say, I only prefer X and Y. White or it's it's an ethnogenesis. So like you have this basic level of mixing, but then you form these new tribes. And I think that I mean the end game is not is basically that people do balkanize into tribes and enclaves. It's like right. the idea that true freedom is a lot. It's something I used to say on the show a lot, is that like true freedom is the freedom to build the kind of society you want to live in. So like, so I say something to strive for is a future where everyone, everyone can build a society that meets their desires, every group. That's, I mean, that's, even if you want to borrow from, say, consumerism and postmodernism, I mean, that should be like the objective just to create these like, Micro, these kind of like micro, micro states where everyone has something that fits their desires. It's amazing that a century ago, you know, liberals love to talk about the creation of a white race and that, you know, Irish, Hungarian, French all mixed it to create, create together to create a malaise white, you know, of European character. Today we have white nationalists, you know, who are, you know, European admixture who want that. But now we're creating a new version of that other ethnogenesis races where you're putting, say, Chinese, Koreans, and Japanese together to create a bland Asian or Asians mixing with whites to create a new white, which is quarter Asian so or something like that. And so there is this right. with bland, egalitarian umbrella terms in these ethnogenesis. The, neo, the neoliberal, they want that. They want this bland, blended society. But it's going to really it's going to really backfire and create basically like something that they're least expecting. Right. Because what's again, going back on sincerity is that people are eventually going to stop and ask for those sincere identities instead of the groining of droops. In other words, people want, you know, white nationalists want a white identity politic with white interest, whatever that may be, uh, seven 11 or rallies, you know, or it's and the appeal of like uh, video games to degree, but say it's the appeal of like theme parks. Because we can't have that in real life, like theme parks or escapism, but like the theme park with like the different lands and the different like sections, like, like, like a Disneyland, like that's basically like it's consumerism and it's escapism, but it's that ideal. It's the closest that we have to that ideal. It isn't just, um, you know, our liberal society wants it to be Disneyland for everyone. It's a consumer fun land. But and then also, uh, like back kind of back to Wilson, I think the other, purpose of theme parks is it is like a radical it is a radical shift in consciousness you build this otherworldly realm it is it is capitalism it is consumerism but it is an extension of con it is a change in consciousness so i feel like i feel kind of like strongly about this it is using like the built environment to shift to shift people's consciousness and create like otherworldly ethereal like ethereal experiences and I mean, there has to be like a spiritual component to it as well, like like theurgy, like almost like it almost has to be like a new religion. 
It's the understanding of subcultures over cultures, where we have one culture of being American, but subcultures that go against being American, where they can exist, and they're never going to go get along with each other. Because instead of the theme park where you're consuming or going to Hot Topic, you know, the subcultural parts are asking for more power so they can be legitimate cultures instead of subcultures. So I think we should rather embrace the subcultural diversity while maintaining the ideal that we should strive for big letter C culture, because it starts as subculture until it becomes culture. And I think Dick, Dick Hebdige knows this, that under capitalism, you have an acceleration. I, of I think also like with, with consciousness, because, because like the origin of conflict, because people have different senses of consciousness, there's a sense like you can't, you can't like just coexist and have like different consciousness because if two people or groups of people are living together and their sense of consciousness is so differently, that's bound to create like conflict. Right. So eventually people are going to go into neighborhoods and then people are going to subjectively choose their own art and their own interest, which was contrast with those. And that's what causes conflict. What is interesting, I would say, is that there won't be an egalitarian meritocracy simply because different people prefer different art and different interests and different beauty types and women and all that. It's better to just embrace the kind of embrace that on an aesthetic level. Like politics is fine, but like the aesthetic has to come first. Instead of fighting over like really petty like culture war and policy issues, people should just say, here is like the kind of the kind of society I want to live in aesthetically. And I mean that includes that includes the built environment, and then like that includes how the people, the the appearance of the people, which gets into like things like like race uh, or genetics. But I do think it's I still I think it's like I think it's much better to just to just put forth like how your ideal society is in a aesthetic sense, than to embrace all these culture all these different like culture war issues or policy issues. We have one friend who's a, a Korean Jewish biker gang. He wants to start the, an Akira esque reality where everybody is riding cyberpunk motorcycles in the anime film Akira. I'm not like that, but I imagine just anime realism and Eurasian futurism, kind of like Big Hero Six or uh, Turning Red. So it's interesting. We have a friend who's more into uh, Akira biker squads, while my petty differences would be no, just anime realism and Eurasian futurism. That so it's like those can coexist together. They don't have to be in conflict. It's just that the differences and the shades. Well, of I think if you are... actually if you embrace the theme park model, then there's there's going to be less. I think there would actually be less conflict in that kind of scenario. Like you want to call it pound enclavism. I think there would. I think people would actually. I mean, it would be like true true diverse diversity in the true sense, rejecting mass homogenization, but I think there would actually be, like, a lot less conflict. I guess, like, some other things I'd like to go over is, uh, like, I've actually been really, like, watching the show uh, My Little Pony, and you have thought of thoughts on, like, the whole, like, brony phenomenon that was huge in the early to mid-2010s. Like, people kind of made, well, people made fun of them, but I, I think the show is relevant because Lauren Faust, her aesthetics, she has that, like, CalArts connection, but I I do think there is influ probably influence from Disney as well. But, yeah, it is like an idealized life and the kind of utopian aesthetics of the show. I mean, what would you say it's really about? Is it about the fantasy? Is it about the ponies? And there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot of romanticism, idealism in it. Each episode is like a fable. Each episode is like a moral fable, so there's that angle to it. I remember there was Buttercup do from Countercurrents, who wrote that book, My Nationalist Pony, but I, I've actually been watching it, and I'm up to, like, season three, and, like, what do you make of that show? Well, originally it began as an ironic joke on 4chan. Yeah, it was ironic. I remember that on 4chan, people, it was sort of an ironic joke, and that's how I discovered it. Like, I saw some account posting brony stuff, and I, I retweeted it ironically, but then I actually watched it. And it turns out it's actually really good. Well, here's the thing. I liked Lauren Faust before she did My Little Pony. I liked her art before then. When she did it, I just thought it was that be power? A was she connected to Powerpuff Girls? No, that that's a that's a friend. That's that's her, um, her husband, maybe. 
No, I thought she was married to uh, Kennedy. Or yeah, that's her husband, Craig McCracken. Yeah, right. But um, she, she, she her, long story short, I thought long My Little Pony would just be a spinoff and she moved to the next. And I think what was happening is that uh, adults were liking her aesthetics more than the ponies. And I think it's a misconception to say, oh, you oh, like, like the, well, well, the ponies, then there's the architecture and, and like the landscape aesthetic too. Yeah. So really we're Faustians as much as that. It's a play on words, you know, like the fat Mephistopheles. Right. We're actually real Faustians who enjoy her art and, um, in her direction. And the, the whole horse thing, it's, it's a bad thing to say we're into bestiality. Or into having sex with animals. I mean, they're kind of the thing about the horses is they're they take on like what's that word anamorphism, where animals well, take on human characters, but they're well, also but they are designed drawn like the they're, they're really big eyes. They are kind of humanoid. to be. I don't know. If, I don't want to use the word sexualized, but to be like super cute. Yeah, I mean, people do sexualize them, and it's okay. That's to true. Sexualize. People do. And they had to make the human version. The what the Esquire girls and you, Equestria. Girls, it's like okay, a human version. Right, and they're even more sexier. And eventually, you know, DC picked her up, and then she did her own DC version with, you know, Wonder Woman and whatnot. But it shows you that Faustian aesthetics are important because it's it's a whole other discussion about the Cal Arts movement. I, th- I think, like, Buttercup do, he said that he liked the, like, he liked, like, the, Gre- like, the ancient Greek city in the sky. Like, what, what's it called? Cloudsdale? Where there's a lot of like esoteric, like esoteric European and like Greco-Roman symbolism in it. I mean, I didn't really watch the show that much. I just thought it was a pretty picture. I mean, ever since My Little Pony and Steven Universe, there's always been copycats to be the next Cal Arts futurism. I've always been an advocate of Star versus the Force of Evil futurism, but nobody seems to like that style. Uh, I mean, it's now moved on to since the Owl House and Molly McGee, but it's the same stuff. It, Disney's quite aware of it. And uh even though My Little Ponies and the Brony thing kind of died out, I think what happened is it gave people, adults, more interested into the CalArts American, uh, car- kind of like an East meets West movement of the best aspect of Japanese art and the best aspect of American 1950s art, and you kind of push them together to create an alternative. And I think it's movement. heavily influenced by, like, old-school Disney cartoons, like, going back to, like, the 50s. Right. Like, the, uh, you, you, the, you, the general, Gerald McBoing Boing and, uh, things like that meets. Or I'm thinking, like, the original, like, the 19, maybe, like, the, even, like, the 1940s Snow White. Right. And so, you know, Tim Biscup is kind of a part of that early um, CalArts movement, too, even though he's left it. And uh, it shows you that it's very potent, that kind of California scene of just uh, Gerald McBoing Boing type of futurism, uh, kind of Samurai Jack. And uh, I think it's now infiltrating the way we make American art. Is there a strong, there's like a strong correlation between bronies and people with autism? I mean, that's just the 4chan thing, and that's just associating on the surface level. I think there's a lot of smart people. I think, like, the Jolly Heretic Ed Detton had a video about My Little Pony, but for adults, like, who have, like, it's like they have arrested development. They're, they're stuck in childhood, but it's, it's not necessarily, like, deriding that. I think, like, there, I think there's, like, a spiritual component to being, to wanting to remain in, a, in like, a place of, like, purity and to reject a lot of the really disgusting things about, like, modern society. So it's escapism, but I think there's something noble and spiritual to that. Yeah, I think there is the reactionary edge. You could definitely... It is that. reactionary, but, like, with bronies, they're either, like, really alt-right, or they're super woke, like, one extreme or the other. That's kind of like the normal in internet culture. It's it's right. hard to find it's hard to find like a fascist into Steven Universe. It's kind of hard because everybody's a lesbian or something. But the point is, you can take the art. So, like, what do you make of like Fluttershy? Uh she's the hottest pony. Uh there's no. I mean, we can get into arguments where you like Rainbow Dash or not, but like Fluttershy is the hottest. Like, I have like, well, I have it like an Applejack doll. I mean, after Jack is, like, blue-collar. That's, like, if you're from, like, Texas or something. I understand. That's, like, Taylor Swift ideal. But, like, going back to Fluttershy, like... I think, like, oh, yeah, like, you know, Applejack's human character in Equestria Girls sort of sort of looks like Taylor Swift. 
Yeah, I mean, if you can go on Rule Thirty Four or the 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 Pony Baru, you can find a lot of good hang tie pictures of her, and you get a good wanks from her. But like, in a way, it's kind of like the Wojaks, the because people project their beauty standards onto them. What's the goth one with the purple hair? What's her called? Midnight the purple something? hair. Twilight purple? Sparkle. Okay, Twilight Sparkle. She represents the archetype of like goth urban girls in inner city Philadelphia. So like all the Philly, white guys. Philadelphia is it? Is what it's called in Equestria. Yeah. So in a way, whites can like express their interest in different types of like elf white women. Like uh, the other one, Rainbow Dash, that's like woke SJW, but I have a white boyfriend type of ordeal. So in a way, the ponies express different archetypes of white people, white girls that white nationalists. I think they're supposed to represent different archetypes of mental illness. Oh no, uh, Flourish, Listen, uh, if you think Flourish is an OnlyFans girl, I don't think that's a Ill- illness. You want to, but I don't see that in there. I mean, I've seen some like weird tortured, sadistic, violent videos. Well, there's creepy... People make, like, the fans, the bronies, they make creepy pasta. Of, like, there's, like, one creepy pasta where, like, Pinky is, like, a serial killer who cannibalizes all the other ponies. I think I've seen that one. Yeah, that's the one I'm talking about. Unless you enjoy that, but, like, it's, like, whatever. You know, people have weird conspiracy theories about these horse things. They think the Twilight is a black girl. I mean, that's kind of weird if you think about it. But uh And then I, I guess I also want to get your thoughts, like what do you what do you make of like Planet of the Bass uh nationalism and like all the esoteric well the um, Euro like the Euro dance genre from the nineties and then all like the esoteric uh symbolism and like absurdism. I think that has a lot to do with nineties Euro trash and this ideal of like taking the real McCoy like seriously as if like a dude is going out to the club and trying to... Have you to- listened to the song? Yes, about having sex and wanting more. And it's like kind of like another night, but it's not another night. And it feels like it was made in the past, but it was made today in a weird ironic joke. But it gives people interest in that because they're rejecting the Chris Brown Negro culture of today in favor of Euro trash dancing around in favor of a, a good Europe. And that's kind of reactionary idealism is in what you're talking about in My Little Pony, where it's like other It's white like people. reactionary, but it's kind of like, it's like taking from post like 90s postmodernism and creating something reactionary from that. And it, it, I mean, it's from nostalgia. Okay, so before we wrap up, do you want to plug, do you want to plug your new book? Uh, my new book is called Suicidal Asian Promiscuous by Joe Nally, yours truly. It is a collection of essays I wrote in the past year and as well as the past five years. It is the best book I have ever written on the topics of Asian Aryanism and queer culture. It is the definitive edition under my name. And a lot of these topics we talked about in this podcast is covered in this book. So you could buy it on Amazon right now or go to my website at www.pilleter.com and order a copy. And yeah, and also I want to plug, I have a book reading, uh, coming up in LA, which I'll keep you, I'll keep the audience updated on that. So, but that's, I mean, that's the show. So Francis Nelly, uh, great having you on. So many interesting topics. Thanks, Robert. Next time.